And we are also seeing that on the other hand, there are many students who respect that the students are not also satisfied what we are giving. I think we should say that. I mean, I, 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 I should have made that. Some students not to satisfy the kind of education provided by the university. In fact, I had one personal uh, experience uh, when working on, uh, on campus, and a few students just stopped me and said, Well, President, can I talk to you for a while? So we sat down by the lake that is Hubei. And we talked about two hours. Very interesting conversation. Is a, I think the two sophomore and one junior in San Diego and two uh, very interesting. And, and the interesting, the first question the student asked was that, can you tell me, President, why I'm here? <laughs> you know, what's the purpose I come here for college education? So that's how the conversation started. Okay, this is very important, okay. Um, and I have also seen, and maybe being an academic world can see that we, we, we have seen every semester I have to sign a paper, a certain number of students decide to drop out of school. They said, well, I, I'm not going to stay, okay, undergraduate, undergraduate. And uh, so that, um, that's something we have to deal with, we have to uh, face, and uh, so this is the time we, we, we think, you know, kind of education we can provide. And I know I want to um, quote, uh, some, maybe some of you already have seen, have seen that uh, statement, and uh, some of you have not. It was about a month ago, because the National Academy of University was searching for their coming new president, and they already decided one. But about a month ago, there was a group of students from NTU. They literally wrote a letter to the newspaper. And then sort of uh, making a wish list to the incoming new student. They hope the new coming student you know, can deal with some problem in the problem. And the, the, the letter actually first described uh, the situation at NTU. I, I think that situation probably reflects not only NTU but many schools in Taiwan. Okay, but uh, let me translate that in English. The first uh, statement was that a large fraction of students enter NTU, the National Academy University. You know, we all know that usually the undergraduate students who went to uh, NTU are among the best in terms of a you know, high school uh, level. And they enter the university without knowing his or her interest and what he or she will learn in the school. They don't have any idea why. It's the same thing as my, our student asking why I'm here. Okay, the second Saying was that for those who know exactly their interests, they cannot focus on the subject of interest because they have to spend too much time on other required courses. We have too many, you know, by demand the required courses. This is the student's statement. Okay, so there no issue the and they are not, not helpful, not useful the courses. And the third one is that the courses are too superficial, abstract, lack of reality, and is not connected to the societal need. This is very true. A lot of our courses will be operating this. Well, I mean, the academic usually is that way, but you know, but this is uh, what students have been uh, addressing. Okay, this is what they describe the status of NTU. And then you continue the letter, the matter of following suggestion. I only cite, you know, a few, not the whole uh, letter. And they ask, they wish that in NTU, all freshmen 
do not need to declare their mission. The first shift. They could be in the college, a specific college, but now have to declare a specific mission, which is good because the first year then you come to school, then you can really spend your time in, on campus. Okay, this is, I think this is a good idea. And the second one, they ought to reduce the total required credit hours to allow more selected courses. Okay, which means the required courses, be that we call it BC, and you can have a more selected, so they can have a better choice. And then to increase the number of online courses so that the student learn more by himself, by herself, okay? which means that the student, school should provide some mechanism um, recording down the lecture that you'd like to hear, but you could not attend a class or something. So you can learn about things. So I think this is a good suggestion. And uh, number three is that the so-called general course curriculum should be more closely related to living, to society, and to be international. And the university needs to invite more people from outside, like what we did today, our campus, to share their experience, to allow students learn more about what happened in real life. Avoid using questions that have standard answers to assess students' learning. And this is specifically for our teacher. Okay. I mean, I think the student act, yeah, you don't want to, uh, I think they hope that the, the question we ask, the teacher has, doesn't need to have a standard answer. And it is more preferable to allow students to challenge the teachers and encourage group study to enhance the close interaction among students. Number four, oh no, furthermore, uh, the university generally does not encourage students to get involved in public issues so that the students do not build up the passion and the interest in public affairs. So this is what they said. You know. So they would hope that uh, the, um, the, the students start the university to change some of that, so they, you know, they can build, uh, establish enough you know, global view and know more about the international trend. And they like to have a more channel to learn how to build up be open to a better planning uh, okay. I think this is a very outstanding letter from college students and uh, who put together and then written to the university, uh, the coming university president. Anyway, so that's this kind of a summary of some of the statements from there. There are some other things that I don't, you know, uh, want to continue. Right? So, this is the subject uh, that really brings me to what we are doing today and the next few days. Uh, and I have noted that uh, since I became the president of the university, and I did some work, and um, I, as a member of the uh, National Academy of the U.S. Mission Academy, I, I'm fortunate to get some publication and report that has been done by the National Research Council, which is part of the so-called National Academy uh, in the U.S. And in the past decade, they have done many, many studies okay, uh, that to address some of the challenges of the problem I just mentioned. Okay. And the, the National Research Council sponsored many that kind of study, workshop, symposium, to cover important principles for structuring learning experience, how to enable people to transfer their knowledge to a new setting. Okay. And this kind of uh, uh, work has been carried out in the US. So, um, and, and this study to provide valuable insight and suggestion on how to develop a more effective and better education system uh, to respond to the challenge. And then after that, so I decided, well, I should be by this member and who has been involved more or less in this kind of a study and to come 
computer and then get some of their stuff and they experience. Okay. And that's how this um, uh, sort of symposium was organized, or the forum was organized. And today is the first one, since uh, we have only two, and um, we'll let them talk more. Now, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce to you our two honored guests. The first one is uh, Professor uh, Malcolm Bisley from Stanford University. Uh, let me read his uh, CV uh, briefly. Uh, professor Bisley is currently um, a professor of applied physics emeritus. Okay, shortly he'll retired from Stanford University in 2010. Although he's retiring, but actually he's more active than before. <laughs> he's still so busy, and he was hence heading the two major labs and so on. Well, anyway, but he's been, he was elected to be the next uh, American Physical Society, uh, you know, the president of the American Physical Society. He's now the so called president elect. You know, the American Physical Society is interesting that has a person involved in the presidency will be four years. Okay. And after now uh, elect, next year will be president, and after that will be the past president. Okay. So we have to do a lot of uh, uh, work for the uh, society. But more importantly, actually, he has another very important uh, position called the uh, chairman of the interesting organization called Associated University Corporation. Uh, we don't have to talk about that more. But that's a very interesting uh, position and to oversee many important activities. Okay, he has a lot of man, uh, honor, but just mentioned, you know, he's the fellow of the American Academy of Art and Sciences and the fellow of American Association for the Advancement of uh, Sciences and the uh, National Academy of Science. Okay. So, so, very happy and honored to have him with us today. And the next one, um, well, I still remember we took a picture today. Do you have a happy one? We had a picture in at NSF in 1987. <laughs> okay. Uh, good. Professor Lola Green, uh, she is now the Guangdong uh, Professor of Physics and also in the Center for Advanced Study of Professor of Physics. Okay. Uh, the wrong name at the uh, Department of Physics uh, at the University in my, uh, in my hand. Uh, and, well, she is really um, an expert with some of the student activity and has done a lot of work, uh, fundamental work, but also uh, made a country, important contribution in many uh, committees to further development of this uh, subject here. And she also has a great honor and many honor and awards. Okay, uh, for example, she is in the uh, John Guggenheim okay, Foundation Fellow from 2009 and she's been to many places like Cambridge as a visiting fellow and so on. And she is a member of the National Academy of Science since 2006. And of her, currently, she is actually heading a very important uh, center. Just one of the three or two in the U.S. for the Supreme Activity at the center. So uh, she is joining us uh, for uh, this week and we are very honored. Uh, so what we are going to do now, i uh, give the podium to, uh, to our two honored guests and they will each speak about 30 minutes and then we can have an open discussion. So we'll be first. You? Okay. Thank you very much. It's very humbling. I don't know what to say after that introduction. But we've known each other quite a long time, and uh, I could tell great stories about you too. And uh, it's been a real honor to know you, and thank you for inviting me. It's my second time coming to Taiwan, and it's a beautiful country. I haven't been to this part before. Oh, good. Thanks. 
Um, so uh, you mentioned the uh, professor who mentioned the Center for Immersion Superconductivity. That's actually, I don't know, there's two or three superconductivity centers, but this is part of uh, these, uh, what they call energy frontier research centers, and there's 46 of them throughout the United States. And um, this is, um, I want to start immediately with transdisciplinary. A friend of mine who works at Wolfram, you know Mathematica? Okay. And um, he actually made a periodic table. He built this thing. Big periodic table. And um, he then published many books and apps. And right before the iPad came out, he went home and did the, if anyone's seen the Elements app for the periodic table, this is a guy who's a programmer and a chemist, across the secondary, very nice. And when Steve Jobs introduced the iPad, that was the only app available. So overnight, Theo Gray became a billionaire. <laughs> and in my center, which I'm not going to talk about very much here, but I'll just mention it, we do many things, many different kinds of work that we do, from fundamental research, theory, computation, applied, looking for new materials, explaining materials, trying to make better current carriers, uh, turbines, and storage for, uh, for energy. And that's just one thing that I've worked on, and what's helped me in working with this broad range of people is, in fact, that I've had a lot of different experience in different areas. And what helps in that? So, um, okay, here, uh, there's 20th century paradigms, and that is that single subject majors are dated. So if you want to just go, go and study your physics, or your philosophy, whatever, in one single area, and then do that, and then go home and do your homework, and go back to school, you're not going to be able to address the complex problems that we have nowadays. Okay, Things like the global climate change are extremely complex and they involve many, many different areas. And so now we just go towards the 21st century challenges, when you get multidisciplinary, in fact it's being called here transdisciplinary studies. And you need to build bridges through teaching and research. And so this is sort of an overview talk, and this is taken from uh, Harvard, a friend of ours named Terry Murray, who started this SEAS program, Science and Engineering. And um, he, she talks about how you need to, engineers can build bridges, bioengineering, material science engineering, information systems, smart energy. And I argue that if you're going to really address global challenges, you need to look at broader things than just mixing physics, chemistry, and engineering. You're going to have to look at psychology, sociology, getting people to make more energy, intelligent decisions, and things like that. It takes more than just studies, and this is the essence of my talk here. I think you can go read these National Academy reports if you want, and there's a lot of information out there in different places. But I'm going to have one thing that I want you to take home with you. And that is that it's not just going to school. You've got to really try different things, experience different things, and that way you can broaden your knowledge and find new areas. As I'm always fond of saying in my area, which is materials physics, that I find the interesting things in the grain boundaries, not in the center of a single crystal. And that's what we want to find, is what's happening between areas. You're going to need to communicate what's going on across disparate areas. And I have an example, which I, I work with chemists a lot. And for someone that's not specifically in solid state chemistry or solid state physics, they wouldn't understand why there would be a real challenge for me to communicate with the chemist, the solid state chemist, I'm a solid state physicist. What's the problem here? There's a different language, and we don't really know how. But what I found is through many discussions, just spending time together, you can find your overlap. I had great success and I had patents in an area where I knew this was going to be important. I would talk with Professor Plumber, I would bring my students, and I knew that what he was doing in interface chemistry was going to help me understand what I was trying to understand in the interface of superconductors. And we talked, and we talked, and frankly, our students would start to laugh because there was no communication until we both found out that we both like to worry about symmetry. We worry about symmetry groups and space groups. We started to talk about that, and one thing grew after another, we built from that, and then all of a sudden we had lots of papers, 
patents, interesting things. It was, it was really a lot of fun. The students loved it. It doesn't just have to be symmetry groups. I've had a very successful collaboration with a friend of mine, and she's a biologist in, in, in the United States. And she didn't know anything about superconductivity or physics, and I didn't know anything about biology, but we talked a lot. We had kids about the same time. We were just friends. And we went shopping together. We went traveling together. And after a while, she's saying D-wave superconductivity, and I'm talking about you know, uh, uh, pair groups and DNA, things like that. And it just, it's this interaction that broadens you. I spend huge numbers of time reading papers, understanding what I need to understand in superconductors, or just any kind of electron correlations. But I also need, if I want to do something really different, and not just repeat the same old, same old, if I want to be innovative, I need to communicate. I need to understand what other people are doing, and they need to understand what I'm doing, to see if we can build from there. Um, so it's not talking about each other or at each other, but a real exchange. So how do a biologist, engineer, and a sociologist address water, energy, or climate change? And that's the question. If I sit down with a biologist, I'm going to be hitting heads together like this. Okay, just bam. No, use my language. No, I don't use your language. No, you're saying this wrong. This is the wrong kind of way, and you fight. The chemist is right. The mathematician thinks they're smarter than the physicist, think they're smarter than the chemist. And I, you, you've seen this stuff, right? And there's no communication. Then you can kind of get into a peaceful, ignore each other. This is the soliton mode. This <laughs> is one strong interacting mode, which is uh, repulsion. And then you can get into the soliton mode, where you don't see each other. You don't communicate. And so you could have chemists, and physicists, and biologists, and sociologists, and material scientists in the same room, but there's still not communication. They're getting along, but there's not communication. With evolution, with spending time together, you'll find your little overlap, and you can find yourself be working together in a synergistic way. You don't know how it's going to happen. It could just be having lunches together. In fact, biological physics was pretty much started by Professor Von Fraunfelder at the University of Illinois, one of the people, who just had his background in, you know, hard condensed matter physics, and just had lunch with biologists every day for many years, and now he's one of the preeminent guys in the field. And I also want to stress that if you come into a university, it is so much beyond the academics. This is very, very important. So, you want to, these are just examples that American universities and people do. And I'm going to ask you about this, so I want a little bit of a dialogue with us here. So here's some poster, here's, is that sideways? Oh, I put that. Oh no, they're lying down in the sun, it's just laying in the sky. Sorry. Well, I should just tell you that I came in late last night, then I took two conference calls and started putting, I had the ideas for this talk, but I put the view graphs together starting about 3.30 in the morning. Um, sports, just hanging out together, music. These are things that are important to communicate with each other, and it'll help you increase your science and increase whatever you're doing. Now I have a question for you guys. How many people here are involved in any kind of a sports team? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. So how many people feel they don't have enough opportunity to be in sports teams? Would you like to be in sports teams? How many, okay, those of you who have raised your hands that are in sports teams, okay? Are you proud of it, or are you embarrassed about it? <laughs> <laughs> you know are you glad that you're in a sports team? Yes. Yes. How does it help you? I, they, they help me, I help them. <laughs> Okay, so it helps you work together. You help the sports team, and they help you. Anything else? Make me to relax and uh, to calm. If I play sports, I feel relaxed. I don't take attention about my work. I just calm and relax. Okay, does that help you in your work? Yeah. Okay, why does that help you in your work? Anybody want to add? 
Has anybody ever, do you have crossword puzzles here? Puzzles? No? Yeah, they did. I think, yeah, we did. Can, can anybody ever do those? Maybe you can do one more. You can do one more. You are asking. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Occasionally or just to sort of. But you notice about puzzles is you start working on them and you get stuck and you go and do something else. Maybe you work. <laughs> Okay? And then you go back to the puzzle and more gets up. That's how it is with work. I will maintain that my best work happened after I had kids. Because I never knew I would not step back enough, I think. But you have to be able to step back a little. But also, it's interacting with more people. It's learning to communicate besides just your science. And you need to do that. You need to communicate. As I'm always saying, the charge of a scientist, a charge, an important job, charge, requirement of a scientist, is to communicate through talks, through papers. Right? Very important. Sometimes we need to communicate very technically. But at least in the United States, it's very important to talk to the public. They're going to vote. I was the funding. Okay, so very important. You need to communicate. So I've had something like 90 undergraduate students in my laboratory in the past 20 years. Not only do I enjoy having them there, but it forces my graduate students to communicate quantum mechanics to someone that has no idea what it is. So that's very important. Now, <coughs> band, orchestra, choir. Okay, how many people, are you all science majors? No? All over? Some are. Okay, so it's all over the place. So, it turns out it's a, my last slide would be physicists playing instruments. I spent my high school singing. <laughs> I'm married to a musician, and it's a place that I needed to go. And not only that, but I think that my performing on stage helps me give better talks. And when I meet musicians, I have to communicate what a superconductor is okay, to someone that has had no science. And do you know what that does for me? It makes me think about it in a different part of my brain. All of a sudden I have to talk to someone who doesn't know any math, or thermodynamics, or any basic science, and tell them what Cooper pairs are. I can do that. Trust me, we'll talk after. <laughs> do you feel it? It doesn't matter. <laughs> but if you give me five minutes, I so that's the way electrons talk to each other and conduct electricity without any loss at all. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? If you had reliable superconducting cables, you could have a light bulb here and a battery in Taipei, and there would be no loss. You could light the light bulb through those superconducting wires. So it's important fundamental research, and it's important to, under, to communicate why there might be impact to our society. So I think this is very, very important. It helps communication, and also helps build ties. Okay? You'll be at band practice. You're marching. That's, that's the Illinois marching band. One of my students who's applying for a Rhodes Fellowship and I think she might get it, she's outstanding. Um, she, so I don't think she's in this picture, but you hang out with people in your choir, or your band, or your orchestra, and you will at some point talk about what you do. And I've had wonderful collaborations happen this way. I had another successful collaboration with a chemist just because we were at lunch together for a whole different reason. 
Very important. You've got to take this time. What about other non-academic activities? Anybody on the campus newspaper? Do you have one? None of you are on the campus newspapers? How cool is that? It's really fun. And you have to communicate. And you get used to deadlines. And all of a sudden, think how this is going to help you think, right? Out of the outside the box. Instead of just going home and doing your homework and going back to school, all of a sudden you have to interview someone who's doing something completely different. Maybe they're a singer. Maybe they're an actor. Maybe they're a politician. Or, or a teacher. You want to do a local story. And you have to communicate that in print. That's going to help shape you as a human being and as a scientist or a philosopher, or whatever your area happens to be. Debating club. Anybody in debating club? Is there a debating club here? You have a debating club. You guys are all, do you know what nerd is? I'm a nerd and I fight it every day. Political activities. Anybody involved in any political activities? Good. Who else? Someone else here? One person. Okay. Are you guys in agreement? Republicans and Democrats? <laughs> you don't agree. So that's fun, right? I, I've gone down and talked to my Congress in completely different areas, try to make a communication. Sometimes it's impossible, but it's interesting to try. And when I'm trying to communicate with someone who's really dead set against fundamental science funding, that's a unique challenge for me. And it helps me think about, they're against funding this science. Why? Let me listen. They're not a stupid person, necessarily. <laughs> so if they have reasons why it's a waste of money, let me address that. Why is it more important to fund my laboratory than to make another missile, or feed somebody, or put money into um, uh, housing or streets. You have to think of these ideas here. Theater. Theater's great. Anybody in any theater here? <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys don't want me to sleep. Okay. You're in theater. You watch a movie every week. That's excellent. But what about going up and performing? How many people have gone on the stage? Have you? Yeah, um, art department, English department, and the annual, uh, and, I mean, the annual event of theater every, uh, every, 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 not every semester, every year. So you go ahead and do that and talk to some of these people here and get them involved, and then you go do something with the science guys. Get in physics club, okay? And then bring someone in physics over to English and be in a play. That's what we need to do, right? Are we going to, now I know I have that first slide that looked funny. I also have it there, besides climate change, what, you know, what about security of data in the net, okay? And not losing the data, okay? These are problems we are just addressing now. And of course, the whole idea internationally of water. That's probably the number one problem on the planet right now, even more than food. We need to work together and find a way to address this. We don't know how to solve the problems, and we need you, we need you guys to be innovative. Okay, sculpture, painting. Anybody paint? Anybody carve? See? Some of you guys are good. You've got to, some of you people that have raised your hands back there, I'm impressed. That's wonderful because you're thinking out of the standard box. I've got lots of students in my laboratory that have come from Taiwan and many other places. And different cultures are different. If you want to really compete on the planet, you need to think out of your box. You need to just integrate your life and your education and your learning. Now, I also wanted to mention this, clubs for cooking, 
Oh, that, that restaurant, the Eco Restaurant today? Man, that was great. Is there a cooking club on campus? There's a cooking club. How many people are in it? Okay. Language, language clubs, okay? Book clubs. We have a book read. Book read. How many people have been involved here? A couple of you, okay, that's good. that's good. Okay, social clubs. So my son, who's at the University of Oregon, gets really upset because nobody talks to anybody anymore. They all text. So he's, <laughs> you know, you ask people out, you date, you, I don't know what you do. I don't, I don't text that much. I text to my children. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so he's starting a club to just sit around and talk. He says nobody talks. So he's going to start a club to just, and he's in geology club, because he's a geology major, but he wants to go past that. He sees his parents, he sees his friends, he sees his, the successful people. He sees that when we have physics parties, there's all kinds of music, there's dancing, one of my students is a belly dancer. I don't do that. <laughs> And it's fun, and it makes you think differently. And so he's going to start a club. It's going to be just a talking club. Okay, very very important. So if you don't see these things, invent them. They're fun. And these are just look at these happy people working together. And they're not of the same major. Okay, what do you do on your weekends or your breaks? Do you go hiking, bicycling, shopping, go to the beach? You go to the beach. Do you go in groups? Good. That's one person. Anybody else do that? Hiking? Okay. So how many people typically work throughout the entire weekend? Good. Okay. I was worried about that. Because some of my students do that. I do that sometimes too. I, you know, you put that all work and no play and make Jack and all board. Okay. It has to be 24 7. <laughs> um, you are not preparing yourself for the future. You need to broaden your horizons. Do we, there's been articles in the United States, do we have too much homework for the kids? Don't always, I'm sorry about the misprint here, but don't always try to focus only on what you're doing. You want to integrate, and you want to broaden out. So, this is the T model, and this is basically my second last slide because I want you guys to talk too and ask questions. But this is the T model that's becoming more and more popular. And this is, it has been my philosophy since I've been probably six years old, which is that you want to really learn something very well. Okay? But you need a little bit of breath so you can touch someone else. And then if you touch another guy here, who's, you know, someone doing superconductivity, and here's someone doing biology. <laughs> and if there's enough breath, you can find an overlap. If you find the overlap, you find a way to connect these things. So you need to be an expert. You need to do those studies. You need to get to really need to understand what you're doing. But you also need to know where. Here's Richard Feynman playing bongos. He took, I've got stories about Richard Feynman, which I won't repeat, but these guys enjoyed life. And if you enjoy life, you'll enjoy your work. There's, I find a great joy in doing physics and a great joy in living. And why should they be completely separated? And you can integrate these things. And if anybody wants to do physics UIC gaming style, I'm not going to tell you where you can find me singing. But one of the grand every year we have a physics holiday party. And this last year one of the graduate students taped a bunch of the people dancing and it's very true to size original. And, you know, but um, it's kind of fun. So that, that's what I want to finish this with right here. Now are there any questions or anything anyone wants to say about my message here? No questions? You want to tell me how to the ceiling in five minutes from the lab? <laughs> okay. So, do you really want five minutes? Okay. I'll give myself three because we only have half an hour. Has anybody ever heard of a superconductor? I don't have the view guess for this. I could have one. Okay, a superconductor. Mm. 
What about you guys? Can I do this? Yeah, the question. What? Pairs and what? Yeah. So what happens is that um how can I do this? I have a more than one minute left. Okay. So what carries electricity in a metal is something called an electron. You've heard of that, right? And then there's a theoretical principle that's been proven many times that no two electrons can be in the same energy state at the same time. Okay? So if you start putting electrons together, they get into higher and higher energy states. If you don't have an electron, if you have two electrons that are working together, then they can fall into the same energy state. And the question was, how does this happen? How do you make two electrons work together? And the problem with that is you might also know that each electron has a negative charge. So they're going to repel. So this guy Cooper came up with this idea called Cooper pairing. That's what you wanted to hear, right? So the way you can imagine Cooper pairing is in fact, the, the law that says electrons repel because they're both negative is called Coulomb's law. So the question was, how do you repeal Coulomb's law? And he came up with this idea that if you consider a boat going through the water and it leaves a wake, right, by the sea, if another boat comes by, it could fall into that wake. And that's where the pairing occurs. He was able to determine that materials that have this Cooper pairing in these kind of conventional superconductors have a strong lattice electron, or the, the, the ions that are in the lattice, electron interaction. Like having a boat that's really heavy making a big, deep wave. So this electron goes in, and all of these ions in the background come in where the electron goes by. Because the ions are positive, the electrons are negative. There's a positive weight, the next electron comes through. So they're not paired in real space, but they are paired, and that's enough pairing to make those electrons pair into Cooper pairs and run through the lattice with no loss. And in fact, in the United States, there's a lot of these in the grid being tested right now, and they work pretty well. So that's that. Did you get any of that? Okay. 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 Laura, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, you might ask why am I here? <laughs> like Laura, part of it I think is because uh, MK is a long-standing friend, and when a friend asks you to do something, you do it. Besides, long overdue to come to Taiwan again, uh, and I'm not here, and I seems like a country. Nor have I thought recently so deeply about the issues that are at hand here. Uh, and um, uh, I was challenged by that, as was Laura, I think. Uh, and it's made both of us think maybe not as deeply as the problem warrants, or the, the issue warrant, but the deeply about certain beliefs we have, experiences we've had, and so on and so forth, about why the ideas that are in this program, which is a national program in your country, under the Ministry of Education. I mean, I visited the Minister of Education earlier in the week, and uh, he really believes in this. Uh, and I do too. And we can talk about whether this is going to be easy or hard or whatever, and let's not do that. But what I would like to say <clears throat> is this reaching out to adjacent fields that Laura so charmingly and profoundly talked about um, is not so new. Um, it is in more important now than it's been in the past, and that's why you're beginning to hear all of this. Now, when I say it's not new, what I mean is there have been uh, uh, schools, if you like, of thought 
that have been doing this for some time, and I was fortunate as an undergraduate to go to Cornell University in the United States. And I'll tell you that story when we come to it. And I, in my talk, I'm going to make almost all of the same points that Laura made. I'm going to make them differently. I'm going to make them on the basis of my experience of going from where many of you are now, or your, your successors who are yet to come here. And, you know, what are the kinds of experiences that will lead you to the skills and the understanding and the depth of knowledge that this will require? And the world needs it. There's no question about that. So what I'd like to do is tell you some stories, okay? Um, and here are the stories. But each story has a lesson. I didn't pick these stories uh, randomly. And they are stories that, uh, that relate to particular experiences I've had, which I think many of you have had, or very similar ones. Right? We're, you know, we're all individuals, but yet again, we all have the same sorts of issues and whatever. So I'd like to illuminate that by a particular case, and the only case I know well is myself. Okay, and as Laura said, Mac, I didn't know that you, were, you could actually get up and talk about yourself like that, so I, I'm not, that made me nervous. I'm not sure I can. We're about to find out, okay? So, <clears throat> so the stories are lessons, okay, from a life of uh, learning and teaching. Laura's younger than I am. I'm much older, so I can now summarize my life, so she's probably like halfway through your life, Laura, or something. So, um, and I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I put these in some, they're actually in an order, but the idea was, these are the titles of the individual stories. So, okay, I tried that font, you know, the ones that are called, you have a lot of the box to use. Okay. Now I'm going to start with the one that, this is another version of what your president said. But what does it mean? <coughs> Why am I here? Whatever. But my story starts a little earlier, and there's a reason for that you'll, you'll get at the end. I mean, I'll, I'll connect it at the end. It's fun to do with the rhetorical sort of thing. Okay, and then there's, you know, big feet, words and ways of thinking, a truly wonderful day. Okay, that was the day I understood something that has served me profoundly. And I'll tell you about that. Uh, okay, so these are the stories. So, uh, as I was uh, conceptualizing this, uh, this uh, approach to the whole thing, uh, I figured I'd need a little break. But this was actually this morning, like Laura, I was working in the morning. And I decided that what I would do is just take a little break and I'd go look at the online, at the, the newspaper or the bulletin board, or whatever you want to call it, where the Stanford News is up just to see what's happening at Stanford, where I work, um, since I've been gone or whatever. And I was amazed. This is the Stanford report. Note that that's Wednesday, May 1st. That's yesterday for them. <laughs> OK. And there, it, this title connects everything that I want to say today. Whoa! The power of storytelling. Well, I like that because I decided to tell a story. So good. That's good. That's a good start. Drive Stanford's biotech bibliotech conference. Now, bibliotech is a French word or just a European word for a library. But what this is done, this is a pun. This is playing with words. It's bibliotech, T-E-C-H, as in technology. Okay. And what it's about is Silicon Valley business leaders and humanity scholars emphasize the economic value of narrative stories at a career, a career form that aims to bring the skills of the humanities PhDs to the corporate world. That goes both ways, but this was about it. Now, who was the featured speaker of this forum? His name is Jeffrey Moore. He was a PhD at the University of Oregon in medieval English literature. 
he wrote his thesis on the fairy prince. I mean, that's got to sound funny to you, because it sounds funny to us. And then he became, he came and worked in Silicon Valley and, and has consulted with companies about how to bring humanistic approaches and thinking to their companies. And he's been enormously successful, made a lot of money, and he's made a big difference. Now, one of the beauties of living in a world where, as Laura emphasizes, you look outside your little circle. Okay, Jeffrey Moore was the gentleman, he and his wife, who hired my daughter, who's an architect, her first job, her very first job as an architect, he hired her. And she did such a good job that after he made a little money and he built this fancy house in Los Altos Hills in California, and he, never mind, you can imagine what that means. She hired, he hired her to, to uh, design, uh, to remodel that house. The point of that story is not to brag about my daughter, although I love to brag about my daughter. <laughs> but it all connects, and it connects in funny ways. You can never know. Okay, you can end, you can say, well, how did you end up having an architect daughter? And there's a story there too, and maybe I'll come back to that. But you know, you know these. If you open your eyes, you can discover these people, and eventually you'll you'll discover all kinds of things. Okay, so this is a to my daughter a world into into architecture, not only into architecture, but into a wonderful human being who who has been the profound thinker about the humanities in in, in Silicon Valley. That's amazing. Okay? You have to open your eyes. This is going to sound like more. Is someone, is he somewhere related to Lord and more? No. No. Okay. Okay, so but let's go back to my little uh, shtick here. I'm going to tell some stories. Okay? Well, I should say, why do I have any credibility in telling stories? For a variety of reasons, not because I can preconceive it or was so smart. It just happened that I built my career around being multidisciplinary. You now you can call it transdisciplinary if you want. I just got started down that path, and I'll tell you how I did. And then, so now, uh, I, I think I have some insight into what happened and what it means, how it might apply to all of you. I hope so, anyway. Okay. Okay, so the first story is, but what does it mean? Okay, when I was 14 years old, I was in ninth grade, I hope I get this right, I was two meters tall and 80 kilos, pretty skinny for two meters, I think that works out, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I had an English history combined teacher, this is ninth grade, so think back to ninth grade. Not science, I became a scientist, okay. This was an English and history guy. And he would, was unrelenting. We'd read something, okay? And he would say, but what does it mean? What does it mean in your own words? Put your hands in your pockets and tell me what it means. And you can only do that if you really understood it. And people will understand it differently, perhaps, in these in, in certain literature. But they have some view that's theirs, that reflects themselves. And he was trying to get this out of us. He used to make me furious. Will you ever stop this? Okay. But he, he made a difference, and you'll see how profound that difference was. So that was the one thing he did. He always asked that question. What does it mean? Tell me what it means in your words. Okay, internalize it. Okay. The other thing he did was to make us write. Now, most of you, well, I shouldn't put it that way, that, that would be wrong here. In this audience, it's like the, the broad enough. What he wanted us to do was to express something personal in the one, the one case I'm going to talk about. So he wanted us to reach inside, form some picture of who we were, write it down in a way that was engaging. Communication. Okay. But not communication that's just dragging it out of off the web, but something that comes out of you, your head, your heart, your feet, your knees, everything. 
Okay? It's a more humanistic kind of thing. Well, I was having trouble with this, and he was patient. I think he said, clever enough, kid. You know, sooner or later you'll figure it out. So I wrote an essay that he just loved. And it was called, it was, it had, I don't remember the title, but it had to do with what it was like to go through life as an adolescent with big feet. Okay, but it was original, it was me. I was writing something about myself and my own voice. That's why he liked it. Okay, my voice about me, or even something else, but it's got to be your voice, okay? So he was doing that, and you know, okay, so then I went on to high school, well, you already know I had the credentials to be a basketball player. Big feet and all that. So, let's talk about basketball. Oh, big feet. I just told you the big feet story. I mean, I, I, that's how I entered literature, was with my big feet. But that, of course, tells you that I must have had some interest in a, a sport called basketball. Now, you all know what basketball is. Laura has made a similar point. For me, it was basketball. It doesn't have to be basketball. It has to be something. But what I learned, people have often said to me, look, you've been a dean, you've been in all these horrible jobs where you've got to deal with people, and so on and so forth. And I said, I went to science because I don't want to deal with people. But I've had to learn how to do it. Where did I learn? Where did I get my first substantive lessons in how to deal with people playing basketball? You had five people, or more, five players on the, on the court, trying to do something together that's difficult to do to win a game. Okay? The level of talent of the five is different. The personalities are different. Some are giving, some are egotistical. It's all there, right? Look around the room. You have to find out this, I mean, put it Each of you in this room has experienced all people of that kind. So you have to learn how to do it, because you want, you have a goal. Basketball is an artificial goal. It doesn't matter. It's a goal. You still got to achieve it. So that's why I learned to deal with people, to lead. Okay, and we did very well. I played in high school near Washington D.C. in the state of Maryland. My senior year, we won 23 games and lost one. Wait, the one we lost was the state championship. Okay. Now, I can tell you, well, it's because one of our key players was hurt and all this, that, and everything. Actually, there's some truth to it. But the thing I didn't mention about sports is it builds character. Okay? When you lose, it hurts. But you get over it, you learn from it, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's, that's the basketball story that came from Big Feet. Uh, what's next? What to become? This is really the question that uh, MK uh, posed to you, or had a student pose to him, really. So I went to Cornell. Why did I go to Cornell? Because they gave me a basketball scholarship. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting scholarship. It was a combination of sports and uh, scholastics, but nonetheless, basketball played a role. So, you know, who knows? So I played at Cornell, too. But when I started, I thought I'd become a mechanical engineer. And I probably could have been a happy mechanical engineer. But at Cornell, they encourage you to poke around a little bit. This is something that Laura emphasized too. Well, I had to take physics, so my poking around was to take a harder physics course because, you know, I felt that I should somehow make you a better person. And it's amazing. I found out how much I really liked it. Why did I like it? Well, you know, it's fundamental things. I, I did pretty good at math. I like that. Okay, that was me. Not everybody in the world should be a physicist because not everybody in the world will like it or be good at it. But it certainly seemed right for me. But there was a side of me that still liked thinking practically. You know, maybe there's some engineering. So I got into this engineering physics program at, at uh, uh, at Cornell, it would now be called uh, Applied Physics, maybe. Uh, but I made a list, and let me find it. So I learned physics. We took all the physics that the physics majors took. Then I took courses in electrical engineering, material science, physical chemistry, 
information theory and statistics, um, aerodynamics. And dot 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 philosophy and art history. Okay? What an education I got. Now, I focused on physics. I took these other courses, and what good did they do? Okay? Well, I started out, you know, what are they talking about? I don't get it. Then I realized most of it is they have different words than the physicist does. It was just words, same concept, different name. Oh, I see. So all of a sudden, the fog clears a bit. Okay, it's just language. Not, not language in the cultural sense, just language, it's just usage. Okay, so then I went, and, and then you get past that, and I said, oh, I see, now I'm beginning to see what the concepts are. Okay, oh, that's kind of interesting. Whoa, I like that. I mean, that's, I'm not as much as physics, but I like it. So having made the investment to be able to, as Laura would say, talk to these people, this was not so much in a group setting, but I began to see why that field was interesting and why some people loved it so much. Like, I like physics. Okay? If you do something you really like, you're in the right place, right? And nobody can say you're a better person because you're a physicist than a philosopher, for God's sake. And maybe in that case, you could have been not confusing. So, so the point is that, you know, you, you discover that if you make an investment to find out what the words mean and get a few of the concepts, you'll find that it's interesting and you'll like the people that are doing it. And that's all you really need to get started. Okay? And I had the privilege, because of the education I was given, to do that in a number of areas. Okay? So I understood that there were other world views that were interesting and powerful. I had not mastered them, but I knew they could do things I couldn't do. That attracted me to them to want to work with those people because I wanted to do things that they could help, and vice versa. And that's the way I built my career. But it started in that way. Um, okay, so that's probably the words and ways of thinking. Okay, that's that story. I learned that it's words and ways of thinking, but you got to get past the words. You get the ways of thinking, then you find it's interesting. Okay, but now, we come to uh, what Laura emphasized, her T model or whatever it's called. I'm a firm believer in the disciplines. It's so easy when you're, you know you have to have this transdisciplinary uh, uh, kind of activity and you need to be involved. But I maintain from a lifetime of experience, and I believe this really deeply, you must at the discipline. And there's two reasons why. Laura said them in a different way, but it's exactly the same. First thing is, if you're going to bring something to the table of a transdisciplinary activity, you better know something well. You better have something to bring that's in, you know, that is, is valuable. And you understand it, you can defend it, you can explain it. Okay? Otherwise, what are you doing there? We don't want dilettantes. Okay. Now, the other reason is related. If you know something well, you also know what it is to know something well. You know whether the other person knows what they're talking about well. And if they don't, I'm not sure they're going to help you. Okay. So know something well so that you have something to bring to the table of the lives you're going to lead, and the good judgment to know when something is really well understood and when not. Sometimes it's not possible to understand it, but then let's be honest about it and not pretend that we do. Okay, that's critically important. Oh, yes. And if you achieve that, 
and you have some success with somebody working in another field, you'll respect them and you'll respect that field. So if you have a discipline, you know what it is, you know something well, and you respect others who have that quality, whether you think what they're doing is interesting or not personally, then you're, you are the largest step taken towards transdisciplinary thinking, all the things that are being talked about here. If you can achieve that, you, you really got yourself moved up the ladder. Now, <clears throat> let me come to this one. A truly, wonderful, a truly wonderful day. This is um, where I may be embarrassed to tell the story, but I'm going to do it anyway. Embarrassed because it's a little kind of uh, self-congratulatory. I told you at the beginning that I had this teacher in ninth grade who said, what does it mean? Tell me in your own words what it means. Okay, ringing in my head for five years. And then there was this experience taking all these other courses where I realized some people think differently. And I don't, you know, I don't quite understand it well, it's not the way I think, but I, I realize that it's important. Okay? So you're not going to understand everything. So I took it, I was required to take a course in aerodynamics. This was back in the 1957 or 8 or whatever, when aerodynamics was the more. Now it's evolved into other things. It doesn't matter. Okay. So typical course about how airplanes fly or something. And I just couldn't get it. The professor who taught the course was famous. He was a nice person. He liked me. I just, my mind worked differently than his. I couldn't get it. Couldn't understand it. I couldn't. So I said, okay, maybe because I wanted to get a good grade or whatever it was, it wasn't a noble purpose to start with. I went home around Christmas time in the U.S. and then, then I come back and I have my exams in January. So I sat down with this book and I started page one and I said, I'm going to understand this, damn it. Okay. And I did. I sort of worked my way through it and figured out how to understand it in my terms. Not his. Because mine are different, not better. But then I understood. I internalized it. I took something that he was trying to explain that he understood, internalized. And I, I, he couldn't work that through me, but I was able to do it if I sat down and said, I'm going to do it. Okay? And then, and then I, we came back, and I had to go in, but well, I went in to take the final exam. And uh, <clears throat> after the exam was over a day or so later, he asked me to come by his office. Why in trouble? Did I do something wrong? And he said, Mr. Beasley, sit down. Oh, this point. <laughs> and uh, he said, you did pretty well on the final, which from a professor means you did very well on the final. He said, however, I have never in my umpteen years seen an exam done that way. What happened? So I said, sir, frankly, you and I think differently. And I just couldn't understand it the way you were saying it. So I sat down with a book and I started through whatever, and I, I put it into my own worldview. And he said, you certainly did. And he said, Mr. Beasley, you're going to go far. Well, you can imagine how thrilled I was. I went out of that office and I walked around all afternoon with a very big smile on my face. Okay. And after I got past that, maybe I'm still not past it, but anyway, <laughs> as that afternoon went on, I thought, oh my God, that's what my ninth grade teacher was trying to tell me. You must understand it in your own words or you don't understand. And I thought, how did he know I needed that lesson? Two things about teaching. First is, 
when you're dealing with things that's profound or transcendental or whatever word you want to put on it, is causing somebody's thinking to change that much. It doesn't have to be. Somebody lays a seat. What he did, great teacher that he was, he said, I'm going to give this kid these experiences. And either he'll get it or he won't now, but someday he will. And when that day comes, he'll get it quicker because he will remember what he did here. And that's what happened. The second thing of that, and that's an act of faith. For those of you who want to be teachers, you really don't know. The second thing is, when you see somebody do that, it's called a teachable moment. You grab it and you drive that point home, which is what he did when he said, you will go far. And then I knew I had it, I'd done it, and I have not been the same person since. That sounds very dramatic and whatever else, but I really learned that's what I need to do. And by golly, I was pretty good at it. And so I think that's allowed me to achieve more, to understand more, to be able to interact with a wider range of people in technical matters and everything else. It's because I understood that. Okay, and it has guided my teaching philosophy, it has guided the way I do the search, it's guided my interactions with a whole range of people, which brings me to uh, the last. I mentioned, I slid it in, that I took an art history course. Okay? But this time I had the Cornell permitted me. I didn't do that so well. I mean, I did okay, but I really liked it. I liked it as a history. I liked it to think that people could do that with their hands or with a chisel or whatever. I just really said, this is really a wonderful thing, okay? This was when I was a junior. A year and a half later, when I graduated, a half a year after that, I married a young woman I met in that last six months. Guess what? She was an artist. Okay. We were married 43 years. Unfortunately, she died of cancer, but you know, we had a wonderful 43 years. So my life, as an adult, as a father, as a parent, as a husband, span on a daily basis the arts and the sciences. Laura has that one. You also confess that you had that. <laughs> it's, it's possible. I mean, we have three people here who are science physicists, for God's sake, who have artistic spouses. It's wonderful. You know, Mary, who you fall in love with, but, but understand that that can be a wonderful way to have a life that is much broader, much deeper than you could achieve if you didn't wander out and get to know people who are really different than you are. Okay? Now, to tie things together, kids, at least people always said to my wife and I, you've left no room for your kids. You've got an artist, you've got a scientist, you know, what's left? You know, my, my older son wanted to be a banker, so that took care of their economics and everything. <laughs> so the one who figured it out the best was my daughter. She said, I'm going to be an architect. Art, science, technology. Okay? That may be, uh, I should have played favorites in my kids. She's my only daughter, so I'm going to be a but she was an example of what can happen if children grow up in that rich and environment. And you want to know what my other kids are doing. Okay, my oldest son is president of a bank in Spokane, Washington. He's going to turn 50 this year, and I think I'm taking it harder than he is. Okay, I have another son who is an uh, ambassario, which is a fancy word for saying he books jazz groups and produces jazz shows, so he's a little closer to the arts. And I'm proud of all of them. So, to conclude, I hope that these, uh, not, that these experiences that I had, that led me where I am, which I think is a, a good direction to go these days, that from my personal experiences and my attempt to draw lessons from them, which, which transcend me or anybody else. They are the, the fundamentalists. But you will reflect on those. Okay? Some of you are saying, what is he talking about?
lost. Some were saying, I sort of see what he's talking about. I doubt if any of you really get it. But in five years, six years, somebody's going to say, you got it, and you are going to go far. Okay. It takes a long time, but it's worth it. Thank you. Great story, okay? So, you want to have a short break and we'll yeah. have a little bit of Okay, so we want to we continue for questions. Between, among us, any questions? Any comments? Okay, I think there's a lot of So, um, thank you, Professor Wesley and Professor Green, and I'm from the SHS program office. And in terms of uh, the communication, I want to tr I want to try to understand your message of your speeches. And I don't know if I uh, understand correctly. Uh, you try to tell us that life itself will bring uh, humanity, science, human science and uh, social science and uh, uh, nature science together. So the, the life itself will combine all the knowledge together. Do I understand? Uh, I would put it a little bit differently. I think it's what I suspect you're trying to say. I don't mean to be, uh, um, well, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I would say, to reflect, to, to, to repeat what the president said, is that the issues of the world today require that we go across that science, humanities, society, or your SHS logo. And what I think Laura and I have tried to do is to point out ways in which you can achieve insights into those three things while maintaining some really strong depth, the T again. And if you do that, and if you open your eyes to the people around you and be non-judgmental about what they do, you will have a very rich life, as I have had tonight. And besides, I am very appreciate that you're sharing about a teaching moment, or a teachable moment. Teachable moment yeah. yeah, teachable moment. Because I have studied uh, education almost uh, 20 years. Yeah. And uh, so that's what I got. So teachable moments is a key point that the teacher can, um, can really teach. Um, the student, and the, in this moment, then the students can really learn something. Thank you very much. Well, the, the student prop, go ahead. Well, you know, I was going to point out that um, I'm not sure if the teacher taught Mac as much as he gave Mac the opportunity to teach himself. Right. And that's the real key. So uh, when, when the students complain to me that these teachers aren't teaching them, they don't have the same kind of view graphs or, you know, uh, slides or whatever, um, they may start out that way in the course, but if it's a good course, they end up leaving it knowing that they've learned. And so it's really a good teacher who teaches someone how to teach them. In the Western tradition, it, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's like the Socratic method, which is where you teach by asking questions. And it can really irritate some young people, I'm telling you. They come in, first of all, they're a little nervous, and you know, and then they come in and ask you this question. What do you do? You ask them a question back. It's a very powerful way to get people to think and learn on their own, but it's very frustrating. So your wonderful talk. And Laura, you mentioned that communication is very important. Unfortunately, I see the next generation seems to go into a different direction. They all text, they sit in the screen, and uh, 
they Facebook, they Google, and uh, but they don't see each other. Uh, also, uh, for Mac, what 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 will you do if you were the nice great teacher that when you say something, the nice great probably didn't know, and you are saying something to all the nice great year and year, and so one is for student, one is for teachers. Wow. Um, I think I would uh, do what he did, just challenge and not expect to see the results of that challenge. Just an act of faith. It has made me very, very patient as a teacher. And uh, you can say I was lucky because of that experience and having this Professor Bear Dynamics who was a great human being who understood exactly what was going on to come in and reinforce it so soon. So I have taken the attitude in my trying to well, look in the graduate level where I had most of my experience, I view my job is to help these people, these students, to enable them to be what they can be, to learn what they're learning in their own terms, because if you are to be creative at the level we expect graduate students to be, you have to have every cylinder firing in the right way. Okay, so I'm not so arrogant that I think I know how to do that. I know how to help people find their way to do it, and I think that's a much more powerful way to teach. Not all faculty do that, but that's what I do. And I do that because of these experiences I have. As I mentioned, my son was so frustrated with this. He's starting his own club at the University of Oregon. Um, I think um, it's just too easy to sit back and text. It's too easy to just sit on Facebook because it doesn't get across. Someone has to go to your Facebook page to see it. Okay, so you have to really, you have to learn to communicate, you have to learn to write, you have to practice writing, you have to give talks. And if you're afraid of doing it, if you're really afraid to get up in front of a group and do it, then force yourself to do it. Join a debating club. Join a play, you know, a group that does plays or something. Um, when I was in um, graduate school, there were very few women in physics. But we got together once every week or two for lunch, and we practiced giving talks. Okay, it didn't have to be about research. It could be uh, a recipe. <laughs> okay. But there you were in front of a group that was friendly. And they said, you know, that was terrible. <laughs> but it was a friendly group to help you grow that way. Um, but communication is essential. And if you can't communicate, I think nothing's gained. It's gone. Um, good afternoon, I come from Mongolia, and the first thing I need to say uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are so glad to, to meet you here. And uh, my question is, could you share us to, um, about your, what was your best uh, choice in your life goes through the, today's taxes. Best choice? Best choice or best decision in your life go, go through today's success. Um, wow. Wow. Um, I think Lord's right, it's not one. But I, I'll try to answer your question. I think it's a series of decisions, and you get more mature, or you get more insight as you go along. Okay, so uh, to those of you who are scientists, there's an analogy to a random walk here. I mean, going around like this anyway. But I think, look, if if imagine some space in which you're sitting, or you're you're living, or acting. Okay, you're here, and you're young, and out here. 
is all this space of interesting things and valuable things. Now, there's some section of that that's going to be natural for you, or maybe a couple, but it's not the whole thing, because you can't learn the whole thing, right? So how are you going to find it? Okay? You don't make one decision that gets you from here to there. You make a bunch of decisions. Sometimes you go off over here and say, ah, this doesn't feel quite right, you come back over here, and then you come and say, oh, gosh, that was really interesting, maybe I should be a philosopher, and then say, well, I really like the physical world. So you, you, you jiggle back and forth. The technical term is you random walk, but there's a bias, and the bias is what you want to do, and that bias will take that random walk and eventually get you where you want to go. But you have to understand it takes time. You have to understand that each of those steps is more important and that you cannot see the end. You'll get there, but you cannot really guess it. Okay, maybe Mozart could, but you know, let's not talk about the geniuses, let's talk about real people. Now, it's, it's, it's much more just try things and find your way, and, and that process is so much fun. And if you say, I don't know where I'm going, you get nervous. If you say, this is too hard, don't look at it that way. Say, gosh, that was interesting, but I really like this better. Or I like these people better, I like the way they think better, whatever. And, and, and you'll get there. Now, wait a minute. You'll get pretty close. I'm 73 years old, I'm still trying to get there. <laughs> um, I've, since you talked about yourself, I'll do a little here. Um, I had a few things that I, I didn't know they were going to be the right decisions, but they were typically times where I would have some time thinking and figure things out and whether well, it's philosophy, and it had to be to follow the passion, right? So I'll just give, you know, I mentioned that key philosophy, which I'm not the first person to come up with, but I somehow came up as a kid that my whole idea in life was to see the world through other people's eyes. And I tried a bunch of different areas, and science was the way that through scientific method I could communicate things. You know, a, a psychic or a mystic who believe in that stuff, they say the same thing, but through scientific method, maybe we could understand what each person is saying. And I had this passion for science. I just couldn't get away from it. Yet, when I started college, girls weren't going into physics. And when I went to talk to the people in science departments, they would say, they're going to ask you if you can type. And it was quite unabashed to be uh, gender specific. So um, I remember taking a good, my mother wanted to be a, wanted me to be uh, a, a teacher because then I would have my evenings off and raise the children. And I had taken one of these general physics courses for non-physics majors. And it was my second quarter, and I remember walking through, this is one of these things you remember every second. I was walking through the physics building, and there was a sign on the physics wall outside the physics department that said, physics majors fill out one of these cards. You could be a physics major. So I filled out the card. I brought it to the department. I remember every step of the way, the secretary takes me around to meet Lee Leonard Jackson, who was my department chair. He shook my hand. It was, I remember every second. I called home and told my mother, and she was very unhappy. <laughs> really unhappy. Laura, you're never going to find a husband. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be able to find a job. And I knew she, I knew that was the case, but I didn't stop. I figured every single day I had physics was one extra day. And when I, they threw me out, I was going to sell shoes. And I never thought I'd have a chance to actually be paid doing it. And so I, I always feel very lucky, and there were times where I was told I wasn't going to continue. I was fired, et cetera, et cetera. But I just had that passion, and I had no choice. So if you want to be a musician, and you really have no choice, or you want to be a philosopher, you have to go and see it. And if you fail, you fail. But if you don't try for it, you're never going to forgive yourself. You go back. I, I have to tell a mother's story as well. Um, <laughs> it, it, my mother was fantastic. I, I described how in the early parts of my college career, you know, I was trying to, you know, I moved from mechanical engineering to physics. Now that's not a huge move, but it was a pretty significant move. 
And when I, I decided at the end of the first semester that, that I really thought that's what I wanted to do, and uh, you know, my parents had been so supportive that I was going to go into engineering or whatever. And so I went home, and I was nervous to tell my mother that I was going to change my major. And uh, she said, well, gee, that sounds interesting, <laughs> you know? And I thought, oh, gosh, thank God, you know? And then, totally unrelated, complete accident, I assure you. About an hour later, she asked me if I would get something off her desk in her study. You know, dutiful son. And I went in, I saw it there, and I picked it up. And on the right-hand side of her desk was a Cornell University course catalog. Mm -hmm. okay. There was one page that was folded down. And it was the department that I wanted to go into. She knew that's what I was going to do, but she never said a word until I discovered it myself. What a woman she was. When when you are um, communi communication uh, in the communication, uh, how do you relieve uh, others' uh, fear of the new knowledge and? Uh, how do you face the hardness of the new knowledge? How should I face, how should we face the hardness of the, the unknown? Are you talking about the, the global problems we're faced with, like hunger and... Oh, no, just, uh, uh, for example, we. I talk about physics. Uh, I'm physics. Uh, uh, talk about physics to to those who uh, measure in literature about 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 physics. Oh, okay, I get it. They they will be fear about physics. So how should I do? Okay, well I can give you many resources. It's something that I care a lot about, I'm passionate about, and um, there's many. In fact, I'm going to a meeting in a week which is a all for public engagement. So as far as physics goes, there's many resources. The first place I would send you for communicating to a general public might be something well, like... I guess the question is, oh. if you want to shift from physics to literature, for example, then he might have a hard to do that. Central. And how oh, I yeah, it's hard. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. And it'll take years to change. And if you have to do it, you have to do it. Um, How did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was a physics major a lot, and I tried different things, but one difficult thing that was hard was I was at a school and very close to my PhD, but I took an opportunity to transfer to a school where I thought I'd get a better education, and that cost me six more years, okay? and. At the time, you feel like, is this terrible? But in retrospect, those extra years in shifting schools and shifting the subfield broadened me. In my department is Tony Leggett, who got a Nobel Prize in physics a few years ago. He was a literature, an English major, an English and philosophy major in the UK, and he switched to physics. And so if you want to try these things, you won't know unless you try. And so you go to the department, and you go to counselors, and you go to other schools and other majors, and get their advice. 
了解吗？调查问问专家的一些调查，不可能。Just try it. Just try it. I, I think Laura is right. I mean, you just have to go do it. And, and one of the things I said I think is relevant is that at first, you know, you probably understand the literature to take, for example, the literary side better because otherwise, you know, you, you want to make that move. There's something telling you to do that, right? The, the problem is perhaps a little bit more that they don't understand where you're coming from and, and they feel that that person coming from physics could never be a literary person. Okay. So you just have to show them that you can, and there are some wonderful pieces of literature that have been written by scientists. Okay, and you know, read them and discuss them. I mean, you have to, if you're committed and you really want to do it, you, in, in the situation you describe, you have to help them learn why it is that you're interested, and yet you have this other side. And if you can succeed at that, you will have done something very wonderful for yourself and wonderful for them too. I've tried. I'm good. Well, I, as Laura said, I was a, 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 a dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences, and Social Sciences, and whatnot. And I, I'll tell you one. I may get in trouble for saying this, but there, I'll, I'll tell you something that should, should be uh, uh, comforting to you. I found that the interest level and the curiosity and the respect and the congenial interactions between the scientists and the humanists was always great. They liked one another. What's the meaning of what the cosmos, and, you know, why do all these things happen and whatever else and you know being taking and they just they have that side of them that, 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 that bonds them a little bit. Where the, where the difficulties come are in the social sciences. Because some of them lead to the science side, some of them lead to the more humanistic side, but because they're both, I mean, it's kind of a turf fight. And you know what I mean, a turf fight? They're fighting over intellectual territory a little bit. But the humanists and the scientists know they're so far apart, they just like each other, okay? They're not in competition, and they find their common ground. And I think you will find that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you may find a wonderful wife, I did. <laughs> oh, okay. um, yeah, I can ask a question for them. I think uh, probably, probably in the U.S. too, but in Taiwan, certainly there's a really heavy uh, peer and society pressure that uh, the college graduates, they need to find a good job. Okay. I mean, a lot of pressure that, well, from parents or society or friends say, well, I'm always going to do this, you are going to get a good job or not, as you said, your mom said, that you say, probably won't get, not get a good job. So there's a pressure that for a lot of students, how you're going to handle that, with that kind of pressure. I have two comments. The first is, have them read the biographies of Steve Jobs and Jobs and um, Bill Gates. They need finished copies. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they didn't even finish college. And yet, look what they achieved. Okay. The, the other thing is you you ask yourself, given what I know now. And I can do. What is that going to? What is that going to become in five years? In five years, you may kind of see it. Ten years, not a chance. So if you don't prepare yourself for the unexpected, you will not do as well as if you. You may start off a little bit better, but in the long run, you've got to make these changes. The world is just changing on a time scale which is so fast. And will probably continue to do so. That a liberal arts education, if you like, by that I mean physics is a good liberal arts education in science. I mean, whatever, you know, just in the long run, it will pay off. I'm convinced, absolutely. I'm 
seen both things happen. I've seen students that um, are pressured by their parents to not go into teaching, for instance, which, uh, you know, like high school teaching, which doesn't pay well. And sometimes they're happy with that choice. But I've also seen students that did go into teaching that paid poorly, with their parents being very sad about it, and they're doing great. They love it. One of my students joined the Peace Corps, uh, just very poor, and she loves what she's doing. But you never know what will happen next, just what Max says. Every step, if, if you believe in it, um, you can see what it brings. Whether you, you know, my husband gives a concert, if he's playing in Car Carnegie Hall, we know it's important. And say, he's going to give a concert at a small church down the street. What's the most important concert? The one he's going to give them. You never, yeah, next. You never know what, what comes of this stuff. And maybe if you choose an area that you can out. As Max says, things move very quickly. It's hard to know. And going from physics to literature to art, if you want to try these things, that's what an undergraduate, that's what you're supposed to do as an undergraduate. That's your, that's in your job description. Uh, my my friend and I are both uh, English major. Um, um, my friend wants to ask one question: that um, as a scientist, what do you think that um, the crisis that in 21st century that can be solved using the those um, cross fields communication that you just mentioned? That um, my friend is interested in that. Uh, as a scientist, what do you think about this? Are you saying? What do I see particular areas or issues or problems where communications, in the sense that you're using it, would be vitally important? Is uh, that, is um, that I mean, cross field. Um, but yeah, connecting two fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what this uh, this thing from the Stanford uh, report that I showed you was. Is that uh, you might want to go look at it, 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 that. You can find it online. Uh, what? The point that was made there, I mean, I only read, you know, three or four paragraphs, so it may be more than what I'm going to say, but it certainly was that, is that narratives, how we communicate, when we communicate with narratives, which is almost always the case when you're talking about, you know, human things, that is a skill which is absolutely critical. Okay, now you may, uh, enjoy English, you say English, well, there's, uh, you know, for you, you have to learn the language orally, and you may be interested in the literature. But in general, nonetheless, any, any humanistic, any study of a, a language would allow you the experience from having learned that, first of all, and the ability to talk across uh, cultures, in that case, in, in my case, it was talk across scientific disciplines. Okay, but if you have that ability, I assure you that it's needed. And it will, you have to find the place where you can plug it in. But, I mean, you said that in the beginning, and Laura said that, and that's what Jeffrey Moore is saying. The, the humanities, the ability to communicate, to write, to write clearly, to write um, uh, critical thinking, we always say goes with writing. Those are skills that will serve me very well. Um, after a question of the delivery, uh, what I was asking is that uh, so, um, as a son, as because both of you are both in, in scientific field, so I want to know what kind of a crisis in the 21st century that can be dealt with um, if we use this. Um, Cross fields communications. Oh, yeah. Okay. I started out with that. Oops. I started out with that. But um, for instance, if you want to address things like climate change or the global energy challenge, we already know we're going to have to worry about physics, engineering, biology, okay, um, and um, psychology, law, economics, all those things. 
Exactly. The value so, is yeah, you're going to start running new kinds of cable to areas that are owned by someone else and training people when to run their dishwashers. It's too, I can't even define it all right now, but I know that we've done, the University of Illinois and different places have done studies on how to bring these things together. But let me just add another one, because I think that's the more obvious one, is when I go to conferences, and I go to international conferences all the time, and I'm a Jewish girl from the east side of Cleveland, sitting there talking to Palestinian and Lebanese businesses with no problem, we don't give a hoot about our politics. We like science. I was at the IUCAP Conference for Women in Physics. It's the International Union of Pure and Applied Physicists. And there's several of these things. And you talk a little physics, and you talk, I was hanging out with Egyptian women, and what do we talk about? Physics, feeding our children, our husband's jobs, our jobs, okay, so communication among scientists is really, to me, one of the keys to world peace. I know that's a big, silly statement. But um, if we could find a way to really communicate that we're all on the same page in so many things, that would help us solve many of these problems. And then stop worrying about property rights when you're trying to figure out where the German goes. I think that, let me, let me try, I mean, I certainly agree with what Laura's saying. I mean, when it's a technical thing, you, you can, you know, the, the communication in a sense is easier because in science there, there are a set of values that are really international. Okay, they're not culturally specific. But where uh, a humanistic approach or sensibility, and I suspect you have that, you wouldn't be asking your question, um, where that's the issue, I have thought about it, but my instincts tell me that where the conflict involves co uh, competing or conflicting values is where the humanistic approach can do the most good. Because you're more in tune with those parts of human our, our, our beings than perhaps Laura and I are. I mean, we all live in the world and have to, you know, but, but you, it's more interesting to you. Now, I wouldn't start with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but, uh, but you know what I mean. I mean, there's a, what is it, Laura? 90% uh, of the problems between people is a failure to communicate. <laughs> okay, fine. So, but I think where there's a values uh, issue is where the humanities really can do some good because they're sympathetic to, to people's strong sense of identity. They're very sensitive to their strong sense of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, how, how their spirituality or uh, their religion or whatever, that side of us, whatever you want to call it, how that really is deeply important to some people. I think that's where the humanities in, in English or Chinese or Japanese or French or whatever else, they all can do a lot. Mr. Fan, can you hear the last question? Yeah. 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 Um, thanks for your speaking. Uh, I'm a student major in physics. Um, uh, I want to share some of my opinions. Uh, um, I think our, genera our generation uh, problem is not we don't know how to uh, we we don't want to communicate, but we don't know how to communicate with others. Um, for example, uh, when we uh, study faces, and the teacher will told uh, us uh, maybe New Newton's second law. What is physical meaning is, and uh, we've learned a lot, but we never try to communicate with others. Maybe I explain Newton's second law to him. Yes, uh, we never try to find um, oral presentation or communicate with others. So I think um, this is the big most, um, it's a problem uh, how why we can communicate with others.
I just loved hearing you talk about trying to identify uh, where a solution might lie, where the problem might exist and a solution might be found. And that's where we need to talk to each other and figure out why we're not doing that enough. I just want to thank you for bringing that up. I don't have the answer. We're just going to keep trying. Well, yeah, I think it is just try. I mean, uh, Laura listed, what, all the various clubs that she challenged you all to admit to you were doing or not doing. You know, some of you were honest, some of you were less honest. But anyway, uh, I think that find an environment that you're comfortable in. Okay, that's a human trust, comfort kind of thing. Uh, and meet once a week with the goal that each week somebody's going to come in and tell you, they're going to say, tell the others what it is they do and why they find it interesting and what it means, you know. And then my high school teacher, Mr. O'Donnell, will be thrilled. Yeah. Okay. But you have to be, you have to have a comfort level to start with. Then you can get into it. <laughs> this gentleman wants to do is solve a critical problem. But gaining the skills of communicating, I think, is best done in a comfort level. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your speech. So it was very interesting. And uh, I have one question. So in the modern world, what kind of a person valuable? Um, uh, it means that uh, many years ago, a uh, high level of people is very um, valuable in the social, valuable in the social. So uh, today, yeah, I think today, uh, um, just uh, who can find information and uh, faster, who can communicate to uh, others, he's uh, valuable in the modern social. I think today is the uh, communication and uh, information is more important. So who can find information uh, faster and who can uh, communicate to others? So what do you think about that? Are you arguing that the most important thing is getting the information faster and communicating it faster? That's a part of it. But just get, gathering the information and redispersing it is going along the top of that T curve. You know the T's? Okay? So if you gather the information, you need to fold it into what you understand and reinvent it and add to it and build on the knowledge. So you don't just gather and hand out. So if I want to understand something about, uh, I don't know, some, you know, something in, a, in a, an area that's not exactly mine but close to it, I'll read about it, then I'll, just like Matt talked about, I'll reinvent it in a way that I understand, and that will put a new dimension on it. And then you can communicate it, and someone else will do the same thing. And you build and grow, and you have to keep that communication growing while you're constantly feeding your expertise. Is that what you're looking for? You know, that's exactly the, you need to build up this effort. You know, I, I would say, um, be your own greatest critic, okay? You can get the information as fast as you want, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. But when you transmit that on, you should put a critical judgment on it. Is this important? Is this correct? The best I can tell. In other words, don't just pass information on, but distill it. You know what I mean? To distill, boil off the, what's the, what's the <laughs> Chinese word for distill? You, you want to get the essence out of what you have, okay? And, and, and transmit that. But there has to be a thoughtful person thinking about what that information is and what part of it is important and what part of it is correct as far as you can tell. And take that distillate, that essence, and transmit that. Otherwise, everything will just be bowled over by information that's incorrect or redundant or, or whatever else. Critical judgment is a human quality. Use it. I, okay, I think to the time, let's uh, stop here. Well, and we'll be here for a day. Anyway, um, I thank.
I think we should really thank the Professor Bissi and the Green for such a wonderful insight. And, uh, uh, now first, I really hope that you can bring the message home and think through what you are going to do here as a student. Thank you. Okay.